Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Victor Emmanuel Nature Tours webinar. I'm Ben Reynolds, host and organizer of this webinar. Thank you for joining us today. We're delighted to offer online presentations about birds, nature, and vent tours. We hope you enjoyed today's topic on Cape Amazing, the magic of spring and fall birding in Cape May by Michael O'Brien and Luis Samitis. During this session, all attendees may download the handouts and ask questions. There are three handouts, the spring itinerary, the fall itinerary, and Vent's current travel incentives. Take note that the 2021 fall migration itinerary has not yet been published. We anticipate that to be ready in October, November. Regarding questions, you may send them at any time. However, we will answer them at the end of the presentation. But if you have any technical questions during the session, I'll try my best to answer them in real time to help you have the best viewing experience. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on demand anytime at your convenience. A link to the recording will be delivered to you in an email in the next few days. Now back to our feature presentation. This presentation is hosted by Michael O'Brien and Luis Samitis. Michael O'Brien is a freelance artist, author, and environmental consultant living in Cape May, New Jersey. He has a passionate interest in bird vocalization and field identification and a serious addiction to migration and nocturnal birding. His travels have taken him throughout North and Central America and beyond. At home in Cape May, Michael serves as an associate naturalist with Cape May Bird Observatory for whom he conducts numerous workshops and for many years conducted a fall songbird migration count. He is co-author of the Shorebird's Guide, Flight Calls of Migratory Birds, and America's 100 Most Wanted Birds, and is primary author of LarkWire, an online and handheld application for learning bird sounds. His illustrations have been widely published in books and field guides including National Geographic Field Guide to the Birds of North America and the new Peterson Field Guides. Michael has also an intense interest in butterflies, leads several birds and butterflies tours with his wife, Louise, and is coordinator of the Cape May Butterfly Count. Louise Samitis is an artist and naturalist living in Cape May, where she is a popular field trip leader teaching birding workshops as an associate naturalist with New Jersey Audubon's Cape May Bird Observatory. She also enjoys leading birding groups and lecturing at birding festivals and is known for her enthusiasm for all natural history subjects. Louise and Michael have been guiding young birders at birding events and conferences for many years. In addition to leading, Luis is field coordinator of the Monarch Monitoring Project in Cape May, served as a compiler of the Cape May Christmas bird count for over 20 years and owns Swallowtail Studios at West End Garage in Cape May. An honors graduate of Temple University's Tyler School of Art, she enjoys working as a freelance artist and her illustrations have been widely published. Her proudest accomplishment has been the raising of her two sons, Bradley, a biologist and artist, and Alec, a philosopher and musician. We are thrilled to have Michael and Louise present about the world famous Cape May. We hope you enjoy the webinar. Without further ado, I will turn the controls over to Michael and Louise. All right, here we go. Uh, well, thank you, Ben. Um, and. Uh, Thanks to all of you out there who are watching. Um, I'd like to say, oops, show my screen. How about that? There we go. Um, Want to say that for, first and foremost, uh, Cape May is our home. Um, we uh, we we love birding here. It's our favorite birding place in the whole world, and um, and we love sharing it with others. Um, so uh, if you're uh, if you have a chance, please come visit us in Cape May. Yeah, Cape May is located in the uh, the southern tip of New Jersey, if, if uh, any of you are familiar with the East Coast. Um, and it's the most 
popular uh, as a seasonal seaside resort with uh, its beautiful beaches, lots of shops and restaurants and many places to stay. And it's known for its Victorian architecture. In fact, it was, uh, it's designated a national historic landmark. Uh, in addition to tourism though, it is also known as the second largest seaport on the East Coast behind New Bedford, Massachusetts, and is the only US Coast Guard uh, training facility for recruits. The year-round population here is about uh, 3,500, but it swells to 50,000 in the summer, which is what we're experiencing right now. Uh, but to birders, Cape May is much more than just a resort town. It's also a world-class birding destination and a major concentration point for migratory birds. You can see the, uh, in the back there, there's the ferry that actually connects us to uh, Delaware. One of the main reasons why Cape May is such a concentration point for migrants is because of the geography. Cape May is strategically located at the tip of a peninsula, which acts as a funnel for birds moving south in the fall and a focal point for birds moving north in the spring. We have a, a great, um, I should, should say, rich diversity of habitats just in Cape May County alone, which uh, stretches about 30 miles north to south and much less than that, east to west. Um, and when we go out and about, we explore these habitats. And uh, this picture here is an example of a, of a woodland habitat, one of our favorites up in Belle Plaine State Forest. And uh, field and field edge, uh, where two, always there's really great birding where two habitats meet. So you can see here, there's a, this is Higby Beach Wildlife Management Area in the spring. You can see the field and then the edge there. And the edge is where you have the birds with, um, utilizing the food sources and um, getting warmth actually in the fall when we go birding there as well. Freshwater, um, freshwater marsh is also an excellent, excellent place to go birding. Uh, this is the Cape, South Cape May Migratory Bird Refuge. You can see the little lighthouse there. And um, that's uh, the freshwater impoundments there attract numerous species. And then we have the uh, salt marsh and the tidal flats. Uh, this is Jake's Landing, which is uh, north of us here. And it's a uh, tidal creek that we like to stand at and look for rails um, during the, the high tide when you could swim, have them swim across. There's also salt marsh sparrows that nest out in the marshes and the, the raptors utilize this uh, habitat in the winter. And then there are the tidal mud flats. Um, we just spent the morning looking at tidal mud flats. Uh, we were out looking at shorebirds and um, the shorebirds, as Michael will talk about, uh, will come and go depending on the tides and the uh, you can visit the mud flats um, either on foot or um, in the back bays. And then we have our, of course, the ocean. Uh, the beaches and the dunes are uh, really great places to scan the, the horizon. And uh, in the look out over the ocean, you can witness the seabird migration or the birds that feed and live at sea. So we're really, really lucky here in Cape May to have so much preserved open space and people that have had the foresight to preserve that space, because frankly, there's a lot of pressure to develop the area these days. It's really quite popular. Uh, we have a nice combination of lands that have been preserved by the Nature Conservancy, uh, Cape May National Wildlife Refuge, and uh, the state, and some private organizations. You can see this map, it's pretty extensive. To date, there's been around 430 species recorded in Cape May County. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of birds. Um, if, if you uh, spend a lot of time birding all, uh, all year and you live here, uh, maybe you'll see around 300 species. So uh, over the course of the years, um, that, uh, a, lot of, a lot of rare birds have shown up. So rarities are always exciting. Here you can see um, a, a number of, just a, a, a little selection of the different crazy things that have shown up from all around the globe. 
like a fork-tailed flycatcher from South America or a whiskered tern from Africa and Europe, a redneck stint from Siberia, uh, ivory gull from the Arctic. So, so things come from all around. I like whiskers. That, yeah, Louise, <laughs> Louise found that whiskered turn. No, no, the second one, not the, the first one. Well, one of the whiskered turns. <laughs> but but every, every one of these birds is, is exciting and, and everyone has its own story. Um, and, uh, and it's all, always a big social event when, um, uh, when one of these rarities shows up. Here's a brown booby that, that showed up um, at Sunset Beach. Um, and, and we have a, a nice communication system in Cape May, uh, text messaging uh, that gets the word out. If somebody spots some rare bird, um, yeah, before you know it, a, a crowd appears. Um, and uh, that's always a lot of fun. Uh, but what's, uh, you know, Cape May is, is amazing for a lot of different reasons. Um, rarities are exciting. The diversity is exciting. But really what makes Cape May so special uh, is the, um, the spectacle of, of migration, the spectacular concentrations of birds that we see sometimes, like, like these tree swallows at uh, Cape May Point. More tree swallows. This is in fall. They tend to gather around Cape May and, and, the, and the coastal dunes, um, and they, they stage there. They, they hang out there for quite a while while they're, um, while they're foraging and, and molting their flight feathers. And uh, so we see big, big numbers of tree swallows. Uh, or, or a spring concentration of shorebirds. These are various sandpipers, uh, ruddy turnstones, red knots, sanderlings uh, that are gathering on the Delaware Bay shore in spring, just spectacular. I've been threatening to make a jigsaw puzzle out of this picture. <laughs> uh, or streams of scoters that, uh, that uh, or other seabirds that stream by in the fall. Uh, or, or loons, flocks of loons parade on by, more dispersed groups with these loons. Or maybe some songbirds like eastern kingbirds, a, a concentration, a spectacular group of eastern kingbirds um, doing some early morning movement. And that's already happening this time of year. We are, we are already, a migration is already kicked oh, yeah. in. Um, or a snow globe of monarchs. Uh, if the conditions are just right, we might get lucky and see something amazing like this. But it's important to realize that these spectacular concentrations of migrants uh, do not happen all the time. Uh, but we sure do like to predict when they might happen. Uh, and, and what we do is we just watch the, uh, watch the weather, all different aspects of the weather. Um, in this case, the wind, you know, what direction the wind is blowing uh, will really dictate uh, what types of birds we should be looking for. This was actually taken last week. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a that was a recent picture. So if the birds are are if the wind, I'm sorry, is coming off the water, uh, that's a good time to look for seabirds, like a like a parasitic Jaeger, uh, moving closer to shore, uh, or to watch for a movement of northern gannet. So here's a little video of some migrating northern gannet. Sorry if it's uh, if it's buffering a little bit, but you might at least get a sense of that movement. This is in spring migration, actually. Uh, birds moving off of Cape May Point. And when the winds are coming from the north or the west, we tend to look to the skies and, and look for raptors. So if it's blowing off the land, land birds. If it's blowing off the water, water birds. So there, whatever wind direction is always something to look for. Uh, if it gets really windy, uh, sometimes raptors may fly low, um, eye, eye level sometimes, whether you're looking for them or not. Some, some folks may not notice them, but, but the birders <laughs> are sure watching for them. And this is uh, actually was the biggest um, kestrel day ever, and that was just last uh, October. On a, a big kestrel flight, yeah. Um, I'm going to play another little video. Um, sometimes if, uh, if weather has bottled up 
migrants if there's if it's a little rain has bottled it up so you can get a a big morning flight of songbirds so this is in the cape may point dunes uh on a on a big migration day lots of birds moving here robins and uh and some finches and blackbirds um, so this is a big migration a big morning flight And it's special events like these that we, uh, is why we love Cape May so much. We also look at radar. Um, that's in, you know, the last decade or so, radar has become a, a thing that the birders are really um, looking at a lot. Um, what this image is showing is uh, basically a cold front, that, that line, that band of green with its yellower toward the bottom, that's a band of rain and a, and a frontal system. And behind that frontal system to the to the west is clear sky, but uh, all those uh, targets that you're seeing there are birds. Um, so each one of those round uh, uh, blue circles is a radar station. And some of them are green in the middle. That just means higher density of targets that the radar is picking up. So that's clear sky, no rain there. Those are migrating birds behind a cold front. So we always like to check our radar and, and uh, see what's on what's coming our way. Uh, when we're looking for shorebirds or really any other um, uh, birds in the tidal marshes, we like to uh, pay attention to the tides. Uh, you know, if we're if we're looking for shorebirds at low tide, we go to some of those tidal flats where they're foraging. Uh, and of course, if we're looking for shorebirds at high tide, we try to find those high tide roost spots. So um, I like to, st to say that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, you know, Cape May has been a birding destination for quite a few years. Uh, way back in the early 1900s, I believe the Christmas bird count started in 1903. Um, birders were coming to Cape May. And Whitmer Stone published the bird studies in Old Cape May in 1937. And uh, we learned a lot even back then, about the history of birding and birds in Cape May. And um, to this day, there, um, there are many ornithologists who visit Cape May and are studying in Cape May, and even more so than ever. And it's really exciting to see the progress over the years. Um, speaking of what's going on these days, uh, Cape May uh, Bird Observatory, which is part of New Jersey Audubon Society, was established in 1976 as a um, research institution, and now it um, has been involved with so much, much more. Um, in fact, Pete Dunn was the first hawk counter here in 1976. Some of you may know that name. He ha ha happens to be a vent leader. <laughs> so, uh, Cape May Bird Observatory runs several migration counts um really five different migration counts um seabird counts in spring and fall at different locations the spring count is uh takes place on cape may point so we can uh watch what birds are are showing up from points to the south and the fall seabird count takes place up on uh in avalon uh which if you're familiar with the new jersey shoreline avalon is a town that kind of sticks out about a mile past the, the the coastline to the north and so the advantage of that is that uh seabirds migrating migrating south offshore uh will cut just a little bit closer um right by avalon so it's a great spot to watch for southbound waterbirds um, of course the hawk watch that's the the longest running count in cape may since 1976 uh, that takes place right down in cape may point uh, right by the lighthouse uh, the um, the morning flight songbird count is a little bit different. Um, you know, you think of a migration count as as for birds that are migrating by during the day, but these songbirds are primarily nocturnal migrants that they are trying to get a little snapshot of with this morning flight count. So these nocturnal migrants, these little warblers and other songbirds, um, are when they when they're done flying at night, they they kind of drop down uh, and find somewhere to, to land. But as soon as the sun rises, they want to uh, reorient and, and find a, some good foraging habitat for the day. 
So um, when we're inland, they'll, they would just uh, reorient by moving a little bit farther south. But on the coastline here, especially at the tip of a peninsula, uh, moving south is no good. So they, they turn around and try to go back north and, or go back inland. So, uh, so they do this little redistribution redistrib flight for an hour or two in the morning. And, and so folks are sitting up on top of this dredge spoil impoundment watching warblers flying north in fall migration. So it's kind of an exciting thing to watch. Uh, then there's the Monarch Monitoring Project. Uh, which uh, Louise has been involved with since its inception. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll have to save that for another day uh, for Louise to tell you more about the Monarch Monitoring Project. Yeah, that, but, that's a whole program. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll save that for another day. But, but we have lots of monarchs migrating through here. And there's a, um, a uh, it's hard to actually count all the monarchs, but they, they do a five mile uh, census uh, three times a day to, to kind of get a snapshot of what's uh, what's migrating through. They tag a lot of them too and lots of educational programs. So migration seasons in Cape May, we always get um, asked questions of when is the best time to come to Cape May and it really the answer is it depends on what you're looking for um, because each group of birds has generally a, a different time frame when it's when their peak migration is happening. Shorebirds for example right now is a great time. Um, the shorebird migration started back in July or even really late June um, and will continue uh, into October. Um, so, uh, and, and warblers as well. So shorebirds and warblers both kind of generally are doing most of their movements in warmer months. Uh, seabirds, uh, raptors, sparrows, a little bit uh, skewed toward the colder months. Um, so so that, uh, that means that the migration season in Cape May is almost the entire year. It's amazing. So with uh, with migration going on all year round, you might wonder, well, how do we decide when to do our tours in Cape May? So we just uh, pick uh, the the time of year with the peak diversity uh, in spring and in fall. So uh, these are our these are our tours that we lead in Cape May. So I'm going to talk a little bit about spring in Cape May. Um, <clears throat> we do our relaxed and easy tour. And a uh, wonderful aspect of the spring is an abundance of the breeding songbirds. And uh, one of our favorite spots in the spring is Belle Plaine State Forest, where um, a dozen species of warblers breed and where there's a, there are wide, lightly traveled roads that make forest birding really easy. And I'm going to talk about some species now that we may see, which uh, we um, neotropical migrants that visit us uh, during their breeding season. This one's a black and white warbler, zebra creeper. <laughs> you can see the long bill there. They use that for going into crevices and looking for insects. Prothonotary warbler. This is one that likes to nest in the, the wet wooded areas. And they're actually, it's the eastern cavity nester uh, for the warblers. There aren't any other warblers that, that do that in the east. And uh, here's a worm-eating warbler and that is often uh, found foraging on dead leaf clusters. Rather than worms, they are actually spider specialists. Here's one that's an early arrival for us. So we see them as early as uh, late March into early April. And this is a yellow-throated warbler, another one with a long bill for picking in crevices. And it's a well-named bird with that bright yellow throat. Louisiana water thrush is a, a fun one to look for because uh, they have linear breeding uh, territories. So you'll stand at a creek and kind of wait and listen and hear it going up and down a creek. And if you're lucky, you can find them um, as they're going along uh, their territories. Here's an Acadian flycatcher. We like looking for their nests. Um, very, uh, in my view, handsome species. And other than the breeding birds, we like to look for the migrants that are coming through. The, this is a boreal nester, nester, a species that goes much farther north from us here. This is the Cape May warbler. 
It was actually named Cape May Warbler because the type specimen or first specimen that was collected and named was found in Cape May. And here's a bay-breasted warbler. So what we do when we're, we're spring birding is we'll look for the habitats uh, where they're feeding. Um, this one is in the blossoms, or this is catkins of an oak tree where they'll be finding insects to feed on. Here's a breeding bird, it used to be a warbler. <laughs> this is yellow-breasted chat, and they like the, uh, the edges. So where that picture that we showed earlier, Higby Beach Wildlife Management Area, um, that's a bird that we could see that would pop out and could even display. And you can even hear them singing at night, which is pretty cool. And if the winds are from the Northwest, we'll scan the skies for raptors and you can often see a Mississippi kite. And that's a Southern stray. And it, um, they've been showing up increasingly um, in the past few years. And it's a, this one picture was actually Michael took right over our house. So we can even look from our own backyard. There's a colony of uh, herons or rookery that's up on the ocean, up near Ocean City. And uh, it's really a magnificent place to visit. Uh, there's different egrets and ibises, and there's even a white ibis this year, which is interesting. These are some four um, different nests. Yeah, that's crazy. That just came in on our alert yesterday. Uh, the uh, four different nests have been established there. So another southern species working its way north. But the picture here is yellow-crowned night herons and their breeding plumage. They uh, like to feed on uh, fiddler crabs out in the marshes. Something that's interesting has happened with uh, man. They've been building jetties in the area, or had been, and um, species from the north have been lingering longer because they utilize uh, the, the rocks and the jetties to, to feed on. And this is the purple sandpiper. And uh, they, we see them in the winter and into the spring. Not very purple, is it? Where's the purple model? The winter plumage uh, is is where they get purple, but my goodness, you need a close look to see it. It's a, it's like a little glossy sheen of purple on the back. They they really look like they're just kind of slaty gray uh, in the winter, but they um, if you get the light just right, you can get a little sheen of purple, like like a like a little oiliness. So all those thousands of scoters that go by during the fall migration. And then spring, uh, we do get some lingering ones. This is a, a surf scoter. Uh, hunters like to call them skunk heads. That's a male. And same with the gannets. I mean, Michael showed that video of the, the gannets just streaming by in March. Um, and we get really big numbers of them. And they generally live off sea, um, out at sea until they go into their breeding grounds to the north. And for the summer, but uh, we'll, if we scan off shore, we can get one going by. And then there are those non-birds. Um, these are bottlenose dolphins and they migrate too. Um, there, we see them here in the, the spring, summer and fall. It's a breeding area for them. And there are boats that actually uh, follow them around, <laughs> not too close. And um, they'll leave us and they'll go down off of the, uh, the the Gulf Coast, off of Florida and the Carolinas, maybe for the winter. And when you visit the salt marshes, you can look for the secretive salt marsh sparrow and the more confiding uh, seaside sparrow. And they are birds that live in the Spartina grasses in the marshes. They actually breed on the ground out there. just off the ground. Oh, clapper rail, yay. Uh, clapper rails are abundant and noisy. And um, the, they're, they're generally secretive. Wouldn't have known that yesterday. We were out and about and how many did we see? Oh, <laughs> we were out, it was a super high tide and we had a whole, like a whole family of eight of them just going along the edge. It was really fun. Jet was just standing on a road looking out onto the, into the marsh. So one of uh, a delightful way to explore the marsh, though, is uh, taking a pontoon boat in the back bays. This is the osprey. And um, it's what's interesting about being on the boat is that when you approach the birds, 
they aren't as uh, scared because you're not a known pred predator when you're in a, traveling around in a blind like that. And that boat is well named. Um, ospreys are all over the place here. And that's a real success story. That's a species that was almost decimated with the use of DDT. And now their numbers have really been um, increasing to the point where there's a lot of competition for nest sites. And this is a species of uh, goose, the brant, um, which is a high Arctic breeder. So they linger almost into the summer because it, they, you know, it's quite cold where they're going. So we um, historically, there have been huge, huge numbers. I know this from the Christmas count data of brant. And they had a big crash when they, with the eel eelgrass um, for whatever reason, which they feed on um, was really hit hard. But uh, we do still see quite a few of them. They've adapted actually quite well to eating uh, grass on, on lawns. So you'll right, see them foraging right. on lawns now probably more than you used to. So the largest lapping gull colony in the world is uh, Ring Island in the area around it between Stone Harbor and Wildwood. And there, it's, oh boy, summer in Cape May is all about lapping gulls. Um, and they got a bad rap because they like to steal french fries, but we just love the lapping gulls. You can see them here and they're just so handsome in their breeding plumage. And um, every single last one of them leaves for the winter. <laughs> and you can see m flocks of migrating shorebirds, um, as Michael said earlier, you know, coming and going from the salt pans, depending on the tides, and uh, really fun to work on the identification of different shorebirds. like one of our favorites. This is a federally endangered species, the piping plover. It's a beach nester. And as you could guess, beach nesters have, have had a bit of trouble these days. As do these least terns, they're beach nesters as well. This is the smallest tern that we have. And this one's awful proud of that fish. She's trying to uh, lure that, <laughs> that female in and she doesn't look too interested right now. Year round, we can see this uh, American oyster catcher. Um, they do uh, nest on the beaches as well. Um, they actually start nesting fairly early in the season. They're not in colonies though. They're just in pairs here and there. And um, they've had their share of problems, but um, we do see them in fairly large numbers during the winter and the fall, of course. Oh, I'm talking about spring, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> year round. Yeah, year round. Uh, Dunlin and semi palmated sandpipers um, do come here in mass, um, utilizing the food sources. This is uh, up on the Delaware Bay shore in, this, in uh, the months of spring. Always a top highlight in spring is the visit to the Delaware Bay where the beach is, and this one is the uh, one that is best known as Reed's Beach. And uh, it's a gathering spot for red knots. In this picture, you can see a lot of laughing gulls as well. And the reason they're here is the horseshoe crabs. And horseshoe crabs have been on this planet, as you see them here, for 350 million years and they are really a phenomenal species um, what they do is they spend most of their time out in the delaware bay on the floor where they feed on um, shells and um, they'll come in and they'll lay their eggs in the spring and with the high tides they'll lay their eggs and they dig up these nests with hundreds of eggs and then the hundred and the shorebirds will come in and they'll feed on these eggs. Uh, red knots, and you can see in here there's uh, ready turn stones. And the red knots, it's a really interesting story. Uh, each particular, each individual will stay up to two weeks. And it's a species that will migrate all the way from Tierra del Fuego um, and go up into the high Arctic to breed. And they stop here to double their body weight 
and it's really important for them to utilize the food sources here because if they don't successfully double their body weight they will not be able to breed and unfortunately um, there has been some over harvesting of the horseshoe crab uh, population and their the red knots have declined over 90 percent in recent history And here's a nice close up of those handsome birds, red knots. Um, I guess they used to be called robin snipes. <laughs> An old hunter, was hunter's name. <clears throat> so, um, whereas uh, spring we do a lot of, uh, spend a lot of time um, looking for breeding birds. In fall, we generally spend uh, a bit more time focusing on migrants and spend more of our time uh, down in the uh, uh, right, right down the southern part of the Cape May Peninsula. <clears throat> uh, we gen we generally start um, early mornings focusing uh, mainly on songbird migrants. Uh, small, you know, small birds like these warblers. I talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, they are primarily nocturnal migrants, and first thing in the morning, they uh, uh, they're quite active uh, as they seek shelter and foraging habitat for the day. Um, we may even see something like an oriole uh, fly over and uh, uh, you know before it settles in early in the morning. <clears throat> Uh, so a lot of these uh, fall warblers can be confusingly plain, like this Tennessee warbler. Uh, but others, like black to blue, wear uh, similar colors in the fall as they do in the spring. This is a male, beautiful male black to blue. One of our favorite spots to visit um, in the early morning in the fall is Higby Beach Wildlife Management Area. Louise showed you some pictures of that earlier. Um, and it's just a nice combination of of forest and field and edge uh, where uh, the, it's good songbird activity. The sun hits that edge early in the morning and um, and some birds uh, drop in there to feed. But there's still a lot of movement going on. Um, the early in early morning, the uh, there's typically lots of flyovers happening as we're watching for birds in the edge. So you may see a northern flicker fly by. Or maybe you'll see an alder flycatcher kind of lurking in the edge. Um, Cape May Point can also be quite productive for songbirds, uh, including right around Cape May Bird Observatory, um, the, the Northwood Center, which uh, recent landscaping there has, has been very successful in providing a lot of, uh, a lot of food, good foraging habitat. It just uh, goes to prove that uh, if you build it, they will come. What they did at the Bird Observatory is removed a lot of the invasive plants that have been taking over the property, and now it has become a birding hotspot, whereas before it hadn't been. People used to come there and say, where do you go to look at the birds? But now they know. So, yeah, birds like this red-eyed vireo, they have uh, excellent foraging habitat, so they might actually settle in there for the day rather than move on. Uh, so as the day warms up, we kind of shift our attention to the sky and look for uh, look for raptors. Um, uh, raptors are diurnal migrants, and and so they depend on thermal air currents to give them lift. One of our favorite raptor watching spots is the the Ray Farm, also known as the Beanery. And this is a kind of neat arrangement that uh, New Jersey Audubon has with the private landowners there. Is that we have the we have leased the birding rights uh, to the to go on the beanery, uh, kind of like you might lease hunting rights to a property. So it's really a, a really a cool arrangement. On on warm days with light winds, raptors can get really high, uh, and that, that's what the hawk watchers like to call the ozone flights. So some days the birds can be super high, but on windier days. Uh, that cut down those thermals, uh, raptors can get much lower and sometimes offer some really spectacular views like this peregrine falcon. 
So in conditions like this, uh, we tend to go to the, the dunes in Cape May Point, uh, which uh, offer a, a lot of advantages. Um, you can sort of see a little of everything there, but the uh, um, but it's a great vantage point for these raptors that are uh, some of them are just kind of hugging the dunes. They're actually kind of trying to get a little bit of lift off of the dunes, and in some cases get out of the wind in the in the dunes. Um, so when we get one of these dune flights of raptors, it can be just spectacular. Um, here's these are all these little dots are sharp shin hawks. So for any of you hawk watchers out there, you don't tend to see this many hawks all at one time, but every now and then when, when uh, the stars align, we can get a spectacular migration of, of raptors through the dunes. And certainly in situations like that, we get uh, lots of good uh, practice comparing sharp shinned hawk and Cooper's hawk. You can see the differences here. Um, the, the Cooper's has a, a bigger head with that kind of Roman nose look around her tail, a uh, little warmer coloration on the back. Um, so when we have one of these nice flights, we get lots and lots of practice telling these guys apart. Yeah, what's interesting about these flights is that it's uh, you're actually witnessing the point of decision. Uh, you have some birds that'll just go for it and just go over the, the, the crossing of water, was it 11 miles to the other side? And you'll have other birds that are just like, no way, I'm not gonna do that. As, uh, as do the monarchs, it's the same idea. So things like sharp chin hawk and cooper's hawk, they might um, kind of wrap around the, the corner of, of uh, well, the tip of, the tip of the peninsula, the Cape May uh, tip, and, uh, and, and move on to the north and try to find a better spot to cross. Whereas um, stronger flyers like a bald eagle or a peregrine falcon or a merlin or a northern harrier, uh, they might just cut straight out across the water, even in a strong northwest wind. So it's really neat to to see that difference. And and the dunes are the best spot, spot to watch that from. I think we just gave away one of our big secrets. Uh oh! Don't tell anybody. <laughs> don't tell anybody. Um, the uh, uh, the dunes are also a great place to watch monarch migration. The um, uh, under the same conditions that bring us raptors, um, especially the lighter winds, the light northwest winds, we tend to get uh, monarchs moving through. And, uh, and sometimes they can gather in pretty spectacular numbers. Um, and I mentioned before, Louise does, uh, has been involved with this monarch monitoring project for uh, 30 years or, uh, or more. Yeah. <laughs> more than 30 years, so a long, long time. And she'll tell you more about that later, but she has tagged lots and lots of monarchs, taught lots and lots of people about monarchs. Sometimes we even see dragonfly migration. Uh, this is a common green darner. That's one of our most common migratory dragonflies. Uh, in September, we have other species that are moving right now even. We have uh, uh, swamp darners and spot wing gliders and some other species that uh, migratory dragonflies. So they're always fun to watch. And it just so happens that dragonflies are uh, the, one of the favorite foods for a couple raptors like Merlin and Kestrel. Um, so when there's a dragonfly flight, very often there's going to be some of these falcons uh, right behind. Another, another fun thing when we're in the, out in the dunes in Cape May Point, we can uh, look out on the beach and see some, some gulls and terns gathering up and, and sitting on the beach so we can get some nice nice studies and, and, uh, and see some, some fun species. Um, we can also uh, look offshore and maybe see a Jaeger, parasitic Jaeger chasing down a turn. So when the uh, conditions are not optimal for watching for migrants, uh, we have lots of other things we can do. We, we look for shorebirds, for example. Um, Here's a stilt sandpiper. And you can see the, the scaly back of this stilt sandpiper tells you it's a juvenile bird. So uh, by September, uh, when we do our fall tour, uh, most of the shorebirds around are juveniles. So that can be a lot of fun. Um, gives us opportunities to, to do some uh, little workshop type comparisons of what like Western and semi-palmated sandpipers and short-billed and long-billed dowitchers. So, Lots of time for some fun study. And uh, even though it's not a 
a big ID challenge. It's always a pleasure to see piping plovers. Just like we do in the in the spring, in the fall, we take uh, that same uh, pontoon boat ride, the Osprey, uh, out into the Back Bay marshes, and we can see a wonderful array of birds there, uh, herons and egrets, uh, more shorebirds, uh, sometimes including wimbrels. There's usually some wimbrels out there. And, um, and, and we'll also uh, uh, scrutinize the marsh grass for uh, salt marsh and seaside sparrows. They're usually out there. Um, so they're always fun to look for. And one uh, really, really fun activity uh, is going out on the beach right near our hotel, actually, um, and watching for the black skimmers. There's a flock of black skimmers that, um, that roosts there. Uh, and skimmers roost during the day, so they feed primarily at night. Uh, they, they, they have that funny bill, that long lower mandible, uh, and they use that to skim through the uh, shallow water and get minnows that are rising to, in the shallows uh, at night. So they'll feed in the tidal creeks at night and roost during the day on the beach out here, so uh, we can always see them. They nest farther uh, north in various spots up along the, the Jersey Shore. Uh, but a flock always collects down here um, and gives us wonderful, wonderful views. So one other thing that we're fortunate about uh, in Cape May is uh, we get to see both sunrise and sunset over the water. So uh, <laughs> how many places can say that? So again, these are when our two tours are. Um, we are dates for our spring and fall tours. Uh, so please come visit us in Cape May, and, and thank you for watching. Well, that was excellent. Thank you, Michael and Louise. Uh, and now we will take questions. We'll see if anybody has any questions. We'll have them uh, come in here through the chat box, the question box. Um, Uh, someone asked, what are the best ways to study and learn bird call identification? That's, that's you. <laughs> um, practice. I, I, I can't think of a, a better answer, really. Um, there, there's, well, repetition. Uh, it's a big part of this repetition, and, and so that's uh, listening to recordings. Um, uh, when you, you read my bio, Ben, you mentioned lark wire. That's a, uh, an example of a, it's actually a game you can listen to. Um, bird songs and it'll quiz you and, and if you get them right you get to move on to the next group so it, so that's that's a good way to, to quiz yourself um, but uh, I'm sure there's a longer answer to that but it's yeah. just practice 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 and there's still the good old birding by ear birding by ear yeah <laughs> in the Peterson series that, yeah. that's really good too uh, someone asked uh, do y'all have a favorite spring and fall bird a favorite spring and fall bird. Um, well, that's no. all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're Robin yeah. and I'm Kathy. Well, okay. We <laughs> we sort of theoretically have favorite birds. I I like I like robins and Louise likes catbirds. Uh, they each have their own stories, but well, that robin um, flights. Yeah. Yeah. One of my all-time favorite experiences in Cape May was a massive, massive robin flight over a million robins uh, in early November one year, and and that's uh, that was hard to beat. It's in the spring and fall, and then oh, swallowtail. I like kites. warblers in the spring warblers. and kites. Oh, oh my gosh, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> whenever the whenever the northwest wind hits, um, yeah. you know, we we see uh, uh, hawks overhead, and uh, th that's you know, there's there's no good answer for that. Uh, I like excitement, and I I like uh, events, you know, migration events. Right. So that's what that's what does it for me. Another question, uh, can you comment on your camera setup for those great photos? Oh, yeah, they are, Michael. I, I did the scenery. He did everything else. <laughs> Some of them are from an iPhone. Uh, I have I have a, um, a Canon 7D Mark II uh, lens or camera, and the and the uh, a lot of those I did with a, a fixed 400 millimeter um, f 5.6 uh, lens. That's become like the a favorite. It's a good, for a lot it's a good the, setup. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you give a quick breakdown of the difference between the spring and fall migration? Uh, if I'm more interested in songbirds, should I come in the spring, for example? 
Ooh, that's a tough one. Well, uh, I mean, well, what I would, I mean, what I would say is, in uh, in spring, you have the advantage of of knowing for sure where some of the birds are going to be. So we have some breeding songbirds. We know where they live, uh, Bell Plain State Forest, and and some other places that we go. Uh, so we'll, uh, you know, for sure see a, a bunch. And in addition to those breeders, uh, you know, we're usually able to find some migrants. So, some you know, some days are better than others for migrants, but mm -hmm. uh, but that's uh, you know we usually find a good number of them in the spring, and in the fall it's um, it's very much migrant focused. So uh, you don't have that added bonus of uh, for sure birds that you're going to see on breeding territory. But generally speaking, there's larger numbers of migrants moving through in the fall. So uh, within the span of a week, you know, we we may see more in the fall. So it, but it's, it's all about the weather. But it's all weather dependent. Right, right. So the spring is less weather dependent if you're looking for songbirds than the fall. But the spring, if you do hit some good weather, or actually in the case of the birds, might be some bad weather to bring you the birds, it's really good. That's why the World Series of Birding is around that period of time when you can get the peak of diversity. That's how we met. That's, that's, <laughs> that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> Was the Robin flight 2003? Do you remember? Uh, they said the sky was black. Uh, there, there may have been a big Robin flight then. There, there was 90, 1999 was the big Robin that flight. That was the massive one. The first yeah. time we ever saw it on radar was 1999. And that was a that was a pretty amazing event. We uh, we heard a lot of nocturnal migrants the the evening before that when it was when that event was starting. Uh, and as the evening progressed, uh, more and more birds were calling. We were out in the on the beach in, in Cape May City, uh, where there's a lot of street lights, and you could actually see uh, hundreds, thousands of robins flying over, visible um, in the street lights. And that was that was amazing. My only regret from that event was that I went to sleep that night. Um, I wish I'd stayed up to see how the whole evening progressed, but uh, because in the morning, that's when we had. Oh. Maybe a maybe a million robins, maybe more than a million, um, and that's uh, that was just an amazing event. Yeah, that flight that you showed was 2012, but that was after a very one of the hurricanes. Yeah, the little video clip I showed. Yeah, Louise just said 2012 was uh, when that was. Can you speak about uh, birds changing their song, uh, like the white-throated sparrows that we've been reading about? Oh yeah, you've been reading about. Yeah, I mean that's that's really interesting. I I can't really add anything uh, about that. I mean it's it's a really interesting observation, and um, you know birds learn their songs from each other, so it's I guess it shouldn't be that surprising that over time uh, a song may actually evolve a little bit. So that may be what we're what we're seeing going on with that. Uh, but I, I you know that's just my guess. More study required. Yeah. Uh, do you recommend birding with you uh, to get acquainted with the area and then staying longer to have more leisurely birding? Oh sure. I mean that's yeah that's a that's a great uh, that's a great idea. Uh, if you uh, if you spend an entire season in Cape May, you're going to see more birds than if you just come for uh, you know a week. So uh, so yeah, absolutely. And and you know that that extra time gives you the um, the opportunity to sort of watch the weather and the tides and 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 go to the certain places you know right you know right when you want to or just go home and take a nap when yeah. you know when you're sort of not interested in what the weather forecast is showing you yeah it is a bit of a teaser just to go to all these wonderful places once and then you're like but what, what if i want to go back yeah <laughs> or the weather changes or you know, one of the, the famous sayings on the Hawk Watch is like, you should have been here yesterday or just wait till tomorrow. But the longer you stay, the more you have a chance to experience that, yep. of course. What facilities are open at this point in the area, uh, you know, during this crisis? Yeah, we're finding out because we're doing a workshop right now. There's <laughs> there's a lot. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for example, we were just up at... Um, Forsyth Refuge, about an hour north of here this morning, and um, and that's uh, you know you can go out and go birding in the big wildlife drive there. Uh, their visitor centers closed. Their um, their bathrooms are closed, but they have a porta potty there. 
So uh, a lot of a lot of places are uh, the, these these uh, natural areas are accessible still. Right. Like um, the state parks, the same thing. The restrooms yeah. are open, but I don't think the building. But, is but none of the facilities are. But are you there. can still go there. Yeah. And Bell Plain, I guess, was o o closed at first, and now that was open for the spring, so that was open. Um, and you, there, the hotel, you know, being a resort town, uh, the people in the restaurant business here are doing a lot of takeout and outdoor dining. No indoor dining in New Jersey right now, but we have not been a, a lack of finding food, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> or great places to eat it. <laughs> Someone says, I was there a few years ago in late September and in Tuckerton, north of you, near right. the Marine Laboratory, Rutgers, where there were tons right. of monarchs on a bush. I can't yeah. remember the name. What is the name of that bush? Well, uh, they were probably up on the Bay Shore near East Point, that, that region. And the bush is probably in the when the groundsel is in bloom. That yeah. was probably it, um, if, if they were nectaring. And uh, when the groundsel or the baccarus goes Backers, to bloom, yeah. they just cover it. So that's probably the other thing would happen is it was a if there was a cold snap they would be covered on it would be a cedar where they would be clustering for warmth but if they're nectaring it would be the, the baccarus or groundsel. Where uh, can you tell them again? Where do you get the radar images? What's the oh, app yeah. for that? Um, you know that actually is um, for, for uh, University of Wisconsin has a website. And yeah, the, you can look at you can look at Birdcast, That's, which is Cornell. Uh, Cornell's Birdcast is a is a good place to go for that. Yeah. Yeah. That that's the easiest answer. Yeah. <laughs> the one on the one that I have on my phone, I actually link to a University of Wisconsin web page mm -hmm. uh, that that uh, has the radar at a real convenient scale to look at. But um, yeah, there's there's various ways you can look at that. Birdcast they actually verbalize it too, so they yeah. give you some background information. Yeah. Nothing like Cornell. They're really they they're amazing with all the information that they have in yeah. uh, eBird and all the. Wow. Well, <laughs> they're on <laughs> top of it. They're on top of it. Yeah. Uh, someone was there and saw night herons uh, just before the lab at, at two. Is it Tukerton? Tu Tukerton. Where they were? Yeah. Were they yellow crowned? They were fighting. Uh, sure. That's up on the Bay Shore. Well, up on, that's up on the Bay Shore and then Tuckerton. Oh, it, no. yeah, Tuckerton. No, no, Tuckerton north. Marsh. Oh, that, that could might, be the people. The, I mean, the people. That could be the ones that are out um, from Ocean City. I suspect reporting. that's Black Crown Night Harris. Yeah, I was thinking. Of, yeah, could be. Yeah, you know, there's the Yellow Crowns and the Black Black Crowns yeah. there. The Yellow Crowns will feed on the Fiddler Crabs, and the Black Crowns are, you know, more. You know, Glorious, but yeah, a lot of frogs and things like that. Yeah, but uh, and the hair, the rookery that I that I showed in the picture that is up on the uh, the causeway going into Ocean City. You can actually look down into the rookery, and it's pretty or heronry. I'm not quite sure what you call it, but it's really amazing what you can see in there. The black crown night herons, the yellow crown night herons, the ibises, both egrets. Glossy. Egrets. Yeah. It's really phenomenal. I have one more question here, and then we'll give a minute to see if any others come in. Uh, can you explain why some birds migrate and some don't? Some s seem to stay in the same area year round. Yeah, that's a great question. It's, all about um, food. it's yeah, it is. It is all about food, and and you know every every species has has its own unique adaptations uh, to you know to to get enough food and shelter. Um, and you know, some have kind of occup you know can survive uh, year round in an area, whereas others are kind of taking advantage of resources that become available at one season or another by moving around. Um, and so, you know, these are just niches that are out there that are getting filled. And you know, um, it's uh, yeah, hard hard to explain it more than that. But but that's uh, some birds have adapted to. Uh, uh, you know, utilizing these niches. It's amazing to think of something like a, a red knot has adapted to migrate way up into the Arctic to nest and spend the winter down in the southern tip of Argentina. And that's 
it gets its best resources that way by by flying thousands and thousands of miles. But but that's what works for them. That's where they have the uh, the best places to nest, the best feeding areas in the winter, um, and that's that's what works for them. Yeah, I like the way you described it. This migration is movement from one abundant food source to another. Yeah. And there are species that have you know, adapted to utilizing food sources here year round, like our cardinal our cardinals in the yard. They know they they'll switch from insects to berries and be able to stay here. But the uh, neotropical migrants, the bug eaters, they can't do that. So they they move to utilize that. Mon monarchs do, uh oh, here we go. Monarchs do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, and you have something like a royal tern that, that uh, breeds south of here and migrates north to the waters off of Cape May and even off of New England uh, to feed in rich waters in the late summer and then turn around and go back to spend the winter in Florida. Uh, so, so they're just moving around to utilize different resources. And some birds, uh, they don't have to move around as much to, to find the resources they need. So, and some of them just stay in one spot. Wonderful. Well, here is the last question. Regarding the robins uh, that, you, that you mentioned earlier, what was their migratory path? Their migratory path. Um, you mean you're talking about that particular big flight that we had? What was that um, on the radar? So the yeah the radar um, the radar showed a big blob of, of robins or birds I should say over Cape May and those birds shifted west across Delaware Bay and and kind of dispersed into the Delmarva Peninsula. Um, and uh, so robin American robin is a species that is a shorter distance migrant. So they, um, you know, we have we have them here year round. They nest here, um, uh, but they also uh, winter in big, big numbers in the Gulf Coast area. So um, uh, they're not necessarily going that far. Uh, and it's, so it's hard to know where those birds actually came from and where they were going. But at least for that big flight, they, you know, we sort of saw where that that big group went. It's funny, before the, all the radar work that was is being done and whatnot, um, and there's a lot more than that now. I have to mention cellular tracking technologies. Talk about the, the cutting edge. They're based here in Cape May and they're they're learning real time migration of the, the species now. And it's been a lot of, it's been amazing watching their work. But uh, before all that, we would just think that they were just going around in circles. Well. <laughs> but now, <laughs> okay, I would think that they were, <laughs> but we know, we know better now. <laughs> well, wonderful. Well, thank you both for this wonderful presentation and for everybody that attended. Uh, um, as thank you. you see on the slide, our next webinar will be Raptor Identification by Eric Brunke. Uh, and so I hope you all can join us for then, September the, the 3rd. Take care, everyone. Have a great day.